What's going on guys, this is Pete Clark and in today's video entitled The 5 Secrets Professionals Use Every Day, we are going to be giving away 5 very useful tricks of the trade. If you apply these properly, there's no doubt that your game will improve a lot and you'll be able to get a nice boost to your win rate, hopefully by following the advice in this video. We're going to be again switching between me narrating and ranting with some weird arty PowerPoint slides and a 200 zoom session that I just played, replaying the action as if it was happening live. This format went down well last time, so I'm going to do it again until you guys get sick of it and tell me to stop. Let's get into the first tip. Tip number one, this is one of my favourite things ever in poker and it's the, the simple concept that recreational players are far more merged than you think. Like you might know that they are too merged, you might know that their range, that's to say, is not polarised enough. But do you really fully comprehend the extent to which they butcher poker in this respect? There's a very common thing when you're playing against a recreational player where you face an aggressive action which against a stronger player would demote your hand to just a mere bluff capture or showdown value hand where if you invest you're just really hoping your opponent has their bluffing range this time and not their value range because their value range would smoke you but when it's a recreational player they tend to add a bunch of medium hands into their range or maybe like hands that look good but aren't so good pair plus draw is a very common one that they add or top pair two pair and a wet texture sets on textures where sets aren't that good they, they kind of underreact to to textural changes sometimes in this respect and when their hand gets above a certain threshold they just tend to regress madly with it so these are spots to look out for we've got an example here where my opponent was recreational and i used a kind of subtle read to play the turn in a way that i thought was best so let's take an example of someone having an overly merged range now and villain has started without a full stack this is always a good indication that he is indeed a recreational player and we decide to 3-bet it up to 12 or 12.50 or something like that. 12.50 seems good. Past Pete, well done. Though I'm complimenting myself with the most obvious and automatic action in the world. 3-betting is king off. Ace-jack 9 to tone and we decide to bet everything here in our range. Or maybe not everything against this guy, but a lot of hands. I've not quite decided if I will sometimes check some hands against this guy or down bet them even more than this. We bet this time and he makes the call. The turn is to 4 of spades. Now... This is a situation where we can bet against small or we can check. These are the only two options. Betting big here is automatically a blunder in this spot. And the reason for that is that Ace-King now has a rather small, what I call, investment ceiling. So an investment ceiling, kind of fancy jargony term from the Carrot Poker School, is the maximum amount of money that your, your hand will want to invest on most textures or on the average texture. Now given that this board can't really run out much better for Ace-King, can't, things can't really get much rosier here for our hand, things are only really going to get worse and so the maximum threshold of investment we want to make with this hand is not going to be a particularly high one. That means we do not want to big bet here and there are in fact not really any hands in our range that need to bet big here because anything like a flush can bet small and jam river, anything that's a set or two pair also doesn't really want to just bomb here and of course our bluffs can bet small and, and then bluff river or not depending on what we think of that spot. So betting small and checking are both definitely fine. Possibly if I had a redo of this hand, I would just bet like quarter pot here, I would just make a really small down bet. And the reason I think this might be the best play is it's very likely to cause our opponent to just call meekly with worse hands, raise better hands, we find out that we're dead. I don't like betting for information, this is a value bet, but there's a lot of transparency that comes with this bet, I think, against this player type. We should also note this is a very passive recreational player, not an aggressive one from the look of the HUD over a very small sample. So I think if I had a redo here, I'd probably just bet small, but I did choose to check in game, which I think is a play in theory, but maybe we should deviate to not making this play here. So we go for a check here. Can't see the check button, it's underneath. We press check and villain goes for this bet here. Now, this is a really interesting situation where if our hand is a bluff catcher, I want to just fold immediately. And what a bluff catcher means is that our hand doesn't beat any of villain's value bets, so it beats all and only bluffs. I do think our hand beats every bluff, like King Queen, King Ten, things like this. And I think these hands will exist sometimes. I think even passive recreational players are perfectly capable of betting with like Queen Ten or King Ten here or King Queen, something like that. I also think they are sometimes capable of merging randomly and indiscriminately with a hand like Ace Five. That's right. Sometimes a recreational player will be like, "Oh no, he may have a flush draw. I need to bet my top pair for protection," and they'll make value bets that are far too thin, like betting Ace Five for this sizing. I think it's just bad. 
or heal bent like king jack of diamonds just in case i have like eights with a spade or they'll put you on some random hand like that it can happen or they'll bet an under pair themselves like tens with a spade because they'll be like wow i have a pair and i have a flush draw and they'll sort of put those two things together add two plus two and get 19. So, given that this is often happening, I think fold is out of the question here. As much as I probably prefer just betting small myself, I think now that we've got to this juncture, we're definitely going to want to be calling this bet because of the random merginess in our opponent's range. Our opponent, with his merged range being a more placid looking foe, is also incredibly likely to define his range further on the river. If he checks back here, we're going to win most of the time, and if he bets, it's going to be a severely underbluffed spot. This bet of 40.44 big blinds is one of the most underbluffed blinds I have ever seen on this river, ever. The, the triple broadway is another trick of the trade. Whenever you see triple broadway and you're not against a really strong player that's good at range building, you're going to see an under bluffing strategy from your opponent for the most part, unless he's just kind of psychotic and betting all kinds of random hands here for no reason. So unless my opponent is one of the aforementioned crazy people who's betting like King Jack here and King Queen and has just lost his mind, this is a very trivial fault. But we were able to arrive at the conclusion that calling the turn was right based on the amount of merges in our opponent's range. Not really because he's going to be bluffing, naked bluffing a ton, but because he's likely merging hands that he perhaps shouldn't be betting. Because we know this, we can make that turn call and we're fairly confident that it's better than folding, that it's profitable. Guys, I'm really happy, but I'm also really sad. I'm sad because this April is going to be the last chance that you have to set our live university style experience of the Carrot Poker School. After that, the school is going to be switching from a live format to a slick professional video course, which will be on sale at carrotcorner.com. This April, I'll be teaching each grade in two hours only. Each class will be going from 3pm to 5pm UK time, Monday to Friday, which is the same thing as 10am to 12pm Eastern time or 7am to 9am Pacific time. Grade 1 is going to be running from the 11th to the 15th of April, Grade 2 will run from the 18th to the 22nd, and Grade 3 will be the final week of the month from the 25th to the 29th of April. Signing up for the Carrot Poker School takes just a few button clicks. Simply head on over to carrotcorner.com and select the grade that you want to take. Or alternatively, why not set our entire full scholarship experience and save £500 while you're at it? If you're not sure which grade to take, you can always get in touch with me on Discord. Just add me there as carrots hashtag 9127. If you do sign up for the school, do the same thing, add me there, and you'll be added to our Carrot Poker Discord server and become a part of the community. Let's get back to the video. My next tip, my next secret that I'm revealing that professionals use all the time is that some spots are huge blunders, massive mistakes not to bluff. Now this one, you might know this or you might not know this. This isn't really like an absolute secret. Like you might be watching this thinking, well, duh, Pete, obviously there's some spots you've got to bluff, but it's not really what you think. You don't actually have to bluff every time you have no showdown value, right? Like a lot of people are, they kind of run into a burning building, proverbially speaking, to retrieve the, the pot, even though they will get burned. It's kind of like, well, I couldn't get my money back out of the burning house any other way, so I had to get go in and get burned to death. It doesn't really work like that in poker. Like if you are in a spot where you have a bad hand to bluff with and you have limited fold equity for the size you're using and your range is not doing particularly well. You might not have to bluff just because you don't have showdown value, but one reason that's absolutely central here that we talked about in our video, The Five Principles of Bluffing, go back and check that out on the YouTube channel, is the idea that when your range is doing well but your hand is doing badly, then you have to bluff because then fold equity is above this sort of break-even threshold called MDF or pot on snorm I call it in the carrot poker school where your opponent's folding the right amount to make your bluffs break even. That doesn't actually happen in spots that are really good for your range and really bad for heads. Let's look at an example of this then. We have King Queen suited here in the cutoff and Villain decides to min race under the gun. I didn't know at the time whether this was a regular or a recreational. He was one of these guys that just kept changing my mind about it. I just couldn't work out which player type this guy was. I assumed in the end he was something in between. Like a kind of recreational player that plays like a regular, doesn't have like glaring horrible leaks like limp calling 6-7 off and stuff like that. I could be wrong though, this could just be a good reg, I'm not totally sure on that. So again, don't, don't berate me if you are this guy and you're like a crusher. I didn't know man, I didn't know. So King Queen here as the cold caller, we're going to want to bet in this spot pretty often. Our range loves this board. We can probably get our bet frequency right up here to nearly 100. 
I don't hate check here. Occasionally, if I roll really high, I should maybe check back here sometimes and not have quite 100% bet frequency. But yeah, he should be checking a lot and I should be betting a lot. It's basically the inverse of what normally happens in a single raise pot where the raiser bets a lot and the caller checks a lot. This is the opposite. The raiser's getting destroyed here. He needs to check a lot. And I, the in-position caller, am going to be doing the lion's share of the betting. So, you can't see my buttons, you can just see the bets appear on screen. Spontaneous. Who knows, what am I going to do? I did decide to check this time. I think this is okay at a low frequency, but I should have rolled here. I don't know why I didn't click my RNG. You can see it on screen there. It remained a 66. I mean, if I used that roll, then okay, maybe. But I'd like to bet this hand even more often than that, to be honest. High numbers are passive for me, so I need to roll something higher to check. But I, I don't know. I don't know why I checked here. Maybe I had action on the other tables. This was a three-table session, so likely I was distracted. Excuses, excuses, I know. The jack comes on the turn, and it's another very frequent bet spot for me. Like, again, my range doesn't mind the jack. It doesn't love it, but it doesn't mind it. My range is doing fairly well. I think we can use big bets or small bets here, not over bets. And I think, again, betting this one really often is good. I did elect to check back again, because this time I did roll. I think. Let's see me roll. Or am I using like a different RNG on another table? I think I roll. Double click that number, Pete. Go on. There we go. 96. So although I'm betting this hand almost always, I'm going to have like a 10 or 15% check with it. And we did roll a 96, so I'm going to, to wait. It's very rare that I've actually waited until the river on such a favourable board for my range to bluff. Usually I have bluffed sooner. That doesn't mean I'm under bluffing because I would have also bet for value sooner most of the time as well. It just means that this is a rare node on the game tree where my range doesn't normally arrive at this way. That said, it's okay for my range to get here like this and when it does, it's very important that we take stock of the situation and note that we have a range advantage in this spot because we're still the cold caller on a low to medium run out and we have a more condensed and less air heavy range than our opponent. While our opponent's range is drowning in such combos such as ace king off, ace queen off, and some suited aces, we are way more likely just to have pairs here and not have too much air. Given that our hand is very near to the bottom of our range, it's going to show down for basically no pot share ever, because although our opponent is checking a lot of weak hands here, they mostly beat king high on this texture, so therefore the EV of checking the spot is zero, and the EV of betting is wildly positive because we expect, in game theory, to get more fold equity than our break-even point here because of how well our range is doing. So strong range, weak hand, you've got to bluff. Not bluffing here is something that we refer to in the Carrot Poker School as River Blunder Theorem. You have to go ahead and make this bet that I'm about to make. You've got to do this. If you don't do this, bad things happen. You won't sleep at night, uh, you will dream of, of horrible things and nightmares and monsters will come into your dreams and then the next day you will probably fall over, you'll fall over your shoelaces and you will graze your elbows and bad things like that will happen to you if you don't bet there. So do remember, bet there to stop those horrible things happening. In reality, of course, you'll just lose lots of EV. That's even worse, right? My next tip, guys, is to use block bets when your opponent has plenty of nutted hands. It's really normal for the better to expect that his range would be more polarized and that the caller's range would be more condensed or squashed towards medium equity holdings. However, this isn't always the case and there are some runouts where the caller or the person that's been playing passively actually has a suddenly a really uncapped range with a large nut region. When this happens to you, you're going to want to size down for two reasons. Firstly, you're going to want to make sure that the range that continues against you hasn't moved too heavily to hands that either chop with you or beat you. If that's happening, then value is running out. You sometimes hear people in the poker world completely exaggerate this point and say damn right absurd things like, if you bet this big, you'll only get called by better, or you'll force him to continue with only better hands or something like this, you'll isolate yourself against the nuts. These are all ridiculously strong claims, and surely the point where we can no longer value bet comes long before we're losing 100% of the time when called. Maybe it's a figure of speech, but I don't think people really understand that that's a massive exaggeration of what's going on, and it would be completely absurd if that was indeed your bet size. You'd be playing very bad poker. Nevertheless, though, you do want to avoid moving your opponent's range towards stuff that chops or beats you to too much of an extent. That can make your value bet no longer a value bet, it can make it bad. The second point about these situations is that you don't have to worry so much about value that you quote unquote lose by betting too small, because sure, on the branch of the tree where your opponent just calls your bet, you might be losing a bit of EV by betting too small on that branch. However, 
Remember that if your opponent's range has just polarized and he has a lot of strong hands here, he's highly incentivized in theory to build a, a raising range. And when your opponent builds a raising range, you're going to get loads of extra money in the form of him value raising hands that you can sometimes beat when you have the nuts, or even him bluff raising you. He should build a bluffing range wherever he has a value range. So you don't have to worry so much about losing a little bit the times you get called and you can focus on recouping all of that and more the times you get raised. So basically the more often you're getting raised, the more polarized your opponent's range is, the smaller your bet should be. Let's take an example of one such spot where it's definitely in our interest to bet smaller on the river. In this spot we have the ace 10 offsuit. One of my least favorite hands in the entire game, it has to be said, we open the small blind and we get a board on which we're not gonna have that high of a bet frequency from the small blind. This hand elects to check this time. We do press the check button there, although it's below your screen and villain goes for a large bet. Ace 10 off suit is just a bit too high up to be folding get at this stage in the hand. We do prefer things here if we have a diamond or something like that, but the ace of hearts, while it blocks some bluffs, it will at least stop villain making as many backdoor flushes by blocking the outs. The 10 is also a good kicker, so when this happens and we hit a 10 on the turn, we tend to outkick our opponent more often than not, because of course, he's gonna be three betting a lot of these jack ace, queen ace, king combos that get to the spot. We go for a check and our opponent checks behind. This is a very common action sequence now on the ace. He's going to have quite a polarized range. He'll be betting good, good ace x plus trips and flushes and checking medium stuff and then bluffing sometimes, checking back some of his air. We get to this river. Now, if we think about what villain's range is at this point, although there are some mediocre hands in his range, like a flush or a seven, they're mostly going to be either well, the 7 is probably the, the only example. The flushes are going to be betting turn at a very high frequency. In fact, people don't tend to slow play enough flushes in a spot like this where, they, where some of them do have tricky, trappy frequencies and, and equilibrium. But anyway, we get to the spot where his range is mostly comprised by nothing and ace -X. Yes, he has a few bluff catches here. So what's going to happen here if we bet small is, well, we can have lots of medium strength hands. We actually have a less polarized range than our opponent has here, weirdly, even though... Um, the ace is good for a preflop range on this run out in this action sequence. We have a less polarized range because we have a lot of combos of 7x kings, queens, jacks, tens, eights, sixes, fives, fours, threes. This this sort of thing is very likely to check call the flop at some frequency on this board, although a lot of over pairs will check raise. Some of them will check call. And we also have just thin value bets um, like 7 8 here, 7 6, and stuff like that. So, block makes a lot of sense. Block betting makes a lot of sense for our range. And Villain will have ASX sometimes. He'll want to craft the raising range here of ASX. And he'll also want to bluff raise sometimes as well in this spot. And he may also want to bluff catch with a hand like King High or Queen High at some frequency as well. As well as like a 7 that he's just decided to bet on the flop and check back the turn. So, we do go for a block bet here. We get the call in the muck and we scoop an okay little pot. It's important here to understand that your range doesn't really get anything by going huge on that river because your opponent's just going to have too stark of a split in his own range between having an ace and having something quite bad. Therefore, I don't think going for an overbet or something like that really makes sense here. Maybe a big bet is okay because your opponent can have some 7x on this node and flushes, but the flushes just aren't going to show up very often after the turn checks through, so I would kind of ignore them and just expect this range is more polarized than that and just bet small. The next thing I'd like to talk about that professionals definitely wield very effectively is the knowledge that calling withdraws is about much more than just pot odds. One very common beginner pitfall that I see, and this is one of the fallacies listed, and I think it's lecture four of grade one of the character poker school, but don't quote me on that, is this don't have the odds fallacy. That's basically how it goes, where the student goes, oh no! We don't have the odds with this draw. And the idea is like, well, no, you very rarely have the direct pot odds to call with a flush draw. But fortunately for you, that's not your only source of revenue after you call. There are two other ways that you make money by calling with the draw, especially if you're in position and have the opportunity to bet freely if checked to on the next street. Obviously being out of position is worse because you either have to craft a donk bet range on the next street or you have to check and accept your opponent has full control over whether money goes in or not. The two things that give you the ability to check to maximize EV here by calling that and make more money than your pot odds indicate are firstly implied odds, the ability to win extra bets from your opponent's stack in the event that you river a hand or turn a hand that beats him and it's a very strong hand, it's 
able to value bet. This is again especially key if you're in position. And secondly, future fold equity. Usually when someone has polarized their range and then checked you, they're then folding a lot naturally in GTO. It's just normal for a range that's already polarized when it checks to you to be folding a lot. Therefore, the value of bluffing later streets when you call with a draw and miss is generally pretty good. The times that you should bluff missed flush draws are when you've already called and strengthened your range, and the times when you shouldn't are times when you've been barreling off. So two very different scenarios there. There's some confusion about when you should bluff these hands. But bluffing these hands profitably or being able to is one of the things that really helps you call with them in certain situations. Let's get onto a hand now where I had the chance to make one such call. So this is a really interesting hand in so many different ways. We have an open under the gun, mid open from a recreational player. I think it's important to find three bits like this. I have one blue tag after me though, as I said, I'm not sure about this guy. And then I have one reg. As long as the players after me don't start like cold for betting suicidally, I should be okay here. King 9 is a very thin 3 bet, it's a losing play in equilibrium against under the gun, but it doesn't take very much for this to become winning. For example, if we restrict our opponent's 4 bet frequency to just 4 betting premium hands, which recreational players tend to do, then we actually get way more equity realization with this hand than we deserve. And this hand actually becomes a kind of mandatory 3 bet actually. If you then factor in the fact that we have a skill edge in position, we can really utilize that position to bolster our skill edge here, then our EV goes up even further. So I'm willing to wager that this is definitely a, a winning 3 bet, and if you miss this 3 bet, it's because you're not deviating enough from your preflop ranges. The flop comes 10 5 deuce. I like betting with flush draws generally against recreational players. In theory, you should be using a big bet here with like all of your range. This is a fantastic board for your range. The 10 is a very friendly broad way for you when you 3-bet button against under the gun because under the gun folds a lot of 10x here. Sure, he has like 10s in his range, but that's three combos. He goes for the raise, which is a bit daunting. We're going to see again a merge range here. We're going to see queens. We're going to see jacks. We're going to see weird hands like eights sometimes. We're going to see bluffs. We're going to see draws, not flush draws, ace three, ace four sometimes. 10x sometimes, all kinds of stuff, mixed bag. I consider jamming here. I think jamming has a bit of merit. You can see me like pull the slider up to the max there. The merits of jamming are that villain could level himself into raise folding for information and fold like something like jacks here that destroys me or that destroys me but it's ahead of me or fold a 10x or something like that. So because he has these merges, jamming is definitely a cool play. And the more I think about it, I quite like jamming. The reason I decided not to jam here is that we are a massive dog to an ace high flush draw, but I wouldn't put it past us to win this pot against an ace high flush draw on a brick run out quite a lot of the time. And when there are seven clubs out there in total between the two players' cards, and the board, the club draw is going to brick a lot and you're going to be able to actually steal this pot from that hand fairly often. That's very specific. Another reason I decided to call here is that the recreational player is just going to start defining their range a lot more as this hand goes on and I have position and I can kind of utilize my skill edge by creating further junctures where decisions can be made by each player in the game tree. So that's why I decided to just call here. I think I like this call. I think with something like King Queen that has more equity to get it in against a 10 or against jacks or something, I quite like just shoving here and I also love shoving with like ace three ace seven of clubs all these hands i'd be jamming here but i think king nine this one is just better played as a call along with things like queen jack and jack nine of clubs my favorite lucky hand of course and things like that so we go for a call here eventually to take my time and then the four very bad card for the for the scenario like his ace three ace four just moved ahead of us he goes for for a turn bet here that's a bit under half of the pot what this means is that our pot odds are now set about 24%. That means that if we are entitled to 24% of the pot here, then we can call, but that's not the same thing as saying that we need 24% equity. We do not need 24% equity to call here because of a few different things. One, if villain checks the river, I will certainly bluff and I will be bluffing profitably because villain will have a lot of other busted draws and weak hands that are check folding. He'll be very inclined to value shove the river with most of his value bets himself. And so the checking range is probably going to be folding more than my break even point would need it to be. So bluffing later is definitely an option. Secondly, a king can easily be an out here against things like ace 10 or jacks that gives me even more equity and of course I have loads of implied odds on a club river. My opponent still has straights, sets, stuff like that, pairs in his range that are going to be stacking off and I'm going to be able to get the last 55 big blinds from his stack very often. So how should we do the pot odds here? How should we do the math? There is a trick you can sort of do here. What you can do is imagine that your equity, first of all, it's not quite going to be all of your outs, they're not always live. So let's say that we have our nine flush cards and our three kings a lot of the time, but not all of the time. That would be 12 outs times two, the rule of two, times multiplying your 
or timesing. Let's go with timesing. Timesing your number of outs by two when you're on the turn and four when you're on the flop to come up with a rough amount of equity. That's okay, but it's not perfect because your opponent can have a better draw than you. And he can also just, you, you may not be live with the king here when he has a set and stuff like that. But let's say that we have like 10 of those outs here and say we have 20% equity. That leaves us 4% short, but we easily make that up due to the combination of of implied odds on the river and of course the the bluff that'll probably be like a slightly winning play when checked to on the river as well so for that reason we're definitely going to go ahead and make a call here this would be a very bad fold to make if you just do the math here and come up with the the fact that you're like four or five percent short of the equity that you need you're doing it wrong you're only thinking about equity ace of hearts river really good card for me to bluff here if he checks i'm definitely jamming he's going to have a lot of like 10x jacks queens now type stuff that just hates this this run out as well as some weird hands that that we beat as well that just over merge like pocket threes or five three or something like that who knows what recreational players are doing here they can have all sorts of stuff he does shove and unfortunately we don't even beat a bluff and we have to fold that's the end of the hand but a well played hand i think by us my final tip for today my last secret is that recreational players are far too capped when they check okay okay secret is maybe a bit of a glorified term for understanding this concept but I don't think people really fully know how to exploit this very severe imbalance in the game of this guy here, this fish smoking a pipe, wearing a, a hat. That's what all of the recreational players look like that you guys play against, by the way. They all look like this. So just imagine this guy, this fish, next time you're playing against a recreational player. Just remember that he's a classy sailor looking admiral fish with a pipe, okay? So anyway, when we get into a spot against one of these guys where they check, especially if they check quickly, but where they check in a spot where they didn't have to, that's to say their check is not procedural, they're not just checking to the razor or the aggressor of the previous street, but they are legitimately checking with a betting opportunity, then their range gets massively capped and what you want to do there is forget your equilibrium output your solver well don't forget it but take it and tweak it and basically adjust it so that you're betting way more of the hands that are optional bets and even betting some of the hands that never bet where the ev difference wouldn't be that big in theory you want to start doing a lot more betting as the following hand shows in the spot we have defended blind versus blind did you see that sky opened i think this is a recreational again might be wrong it's just that look these other guys are all tagged yellow i know those guys i've seen them all before i've not seen this guy so he could be a reg it's just unlikely Again, don't be like, Yeah, Pete Clark called me a recreational! I study pile! Don't do that. So, Ace-9. This spot is usually just going to be a pretty bog-standard... Hmm? Well, I was going to say a check. It's going to be a check really often, I think, with Ace-9. I think with the Nine of Spades, though, and all this equity, we can start sort of pseudo-bluffing, especially because Villain does fold a fair amount of better Ace high on such a messy texture. So, yeah, I do actually think that bluffing here is, is completely fine if we want to. And um, we can also just check back. I've probably rolled the dice here. If I use this 93, I'll be checking. I don't know if I re-roll it or something. You can see I use the RNG sometimes. I don't really have a strong opinion here, so usually I have an exploit, I wouldn't use this, but here I decide that, here I think I decide that checking might just be better, you know, we have a lot of showdown value, the range is too capped, he may be over bluffing the turn, I don't really want to bet and get raised here, I think I, think I just landed on the idea that check is, is best here. On the Queen of Spades, I think in Equilibrium I just have a check, I have a hand that isn't making enough of his better hands fold to start betting and has a bit too much showdown value. So while I don't think there's a problem with bluffing King-9 offsuit with the Nine of Spades here, or Jack-9 or even something like a random gutter here, I do think there's a problem with bluffing this in Equilibrium. However, because this is a suspected recreational player and he's checked twice rather quickly, his range is going to be way too capped here and what we can actually do is bet as a semi-bluff and then just blast rivers and do really well. I don't think for a second that enough flushes, sets, straights or queen X or two pair are making their way into this opponent's checking range, so this now just becomes a bet. I don't care what game theory says, so don't watch this back and be like, Ah, my solver says that that's a check! Arr. That's the whole point, I'm deviating from the solver, you bozo. I'm deviating! Shouldn't call the YouTube audience bozos. But if anyone thinks like that, then they need to learn, right? They need to see the error of their ways, because what we're trying to do here is teach you to think on this channel. This is what I do in my poker school and my one-to-ones. I teach you to think. It's not about copying solver output, so here we definitely want to be deviating. I have no doubt that bet returns a higher EV than check here because it sets up the opportunity to blast river really big with a spade blocker, and that's just the spade blocker is like honestly salt in villain's wounds. It's not even necessary, it's overkill. But yeah, we want to do a lot of aggressing bluffing in a spot like this. 
Guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this format. Let me know what you think about it down below. It really helps the YouTube channel if you can give this video a like and also subscribe to the channel so that you're notified when new videos come out. We are trying to take over the poker YouTube sphere, if that's a word. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're going to do it. So help us on our quest and I'll bring you guys more content like this very soon. Like I say, until you get sick of this format of switching between nuggets of wisdom and hands, I will keep bringing it to you because I really like making it. Okay guys, this has been Pete Clark, see you in the next video and good luck at the tables. Bye for now.